America is in the midst of an historic surge in legalized gambling. And that's a cover. And that's ten thousand five hundred dollars. Now that sports betting is completely legal in all these states, you can just open up an app on your phone. New technology gives 24-7 access to sports books, while gambling operators spend billions on advertising. The advertisements are clear as day that if you're gonna come down here, <laughs> make sure you're putting some money on the game. Now, addiction groups say problem gambling is on the rise, with more young people seeking help than ever before. I had fallen deeper into the world of online sports betting. My life was completely shattered. Before online casinos, if we had a person coming in only 24 years old, it was rare. Now kids coming in at 17 years old. That's the norm. Draw. I'm going to swing as hard as I can. And if I find the fairway beautiful. Sports betting is just an innate passion. Tennessee today, minus seven. Navy, Army, football? Oh, it's always the under. Under. Has yeah. to be. How about this? For anything worse than five under, you and I have three in a game tonight. So for me, 7,500. And for you, 3,000. With sports betting, it's a roller coaster. The entire game, you're at a high, your dopamine's going crazy, and then all of a sudden, oh. you're as heartbroken as you could be. Hard left. You Why'd you tell me to go right you, at it? That's where you were aiming. So I'm gonna have $7,500 on the Bonnies tonight. Dorm, as he's known online, is a recent St. Bonaventure graduate and professional sports better. Boys, it's Sunday, which means we have prize picks again. NFL as a student, so he created a subscription service called Dorm Room Degenerates, where he gives sports betting advice based on algorithms he created to simulate game outcomes. Just like a stockbroker tells people what to invest in and they make money in the stock market, I tell people what to bet on and they make money in the sports betting market. So you're a financial consultant. That's what I like to tell people, yeah. <laughs> you good? One of the best. My first year when it took off, I made about $200,000, $250,000 betting and then about another two to two fifty dollars selling subscriptions. This year, the subscriptions have taken off. I'm going to do about 300 to 350, depending on how December goes, sports betting, and about 500 to 600 um, in selling subscriptions. Wow. Yeah. What do you think is driving the spike in popularity? I think it's legality. Now that it, it, sports betting is completely legal in New York, Pennsylvania, all these other states, you can just open up an app on your phone. In 2018, the Supreme Court ended a decades-long ban on commercialized sports betting paving the way for mobile apps like FanDuel and DraftKings to offer legal alternatives to black market sports books. We know there's an enormous amount of illegal sports betting in the United States. Let's make it transparent. Let's regulate it. Professional leagues that previously opposed gambling following high profile scandals have since embraced the industry, collecting billions in revenue. In the five years since the ban was lifted, Americans have legally bet $300 billion on sports. And according to an NCAA survey, Nearly 60% of 18 to 22 year olds have placed a bet, with 16% engaging in risky behavior. Do you think the industry focuses on, on young people? Obviously these big sports books are gonna say that, no, of course we don't do that. But I think it's crucial. They wouldn't be able to survive if they weren't targeting young people because who's gonna bet in 20, 30 years? It's gonna be these people that they're trying to bring in now. How widespread is, is sports betting on college campuses? Oh my gosh, it's everywhere. When I started, it wasn't huge. Like There was only a small group of people doing it. Now, you can't walk into a male dormitory in a college campus without sports betting happening. One time for the kid, get a stop. Go! Yes? What do you guys yes. have? We have the Rams. Yeah, Rams. No, I love the Rams. Seven and a half, let's go. What's huge this? possession. Oh my oh, god! Oh, 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 oh. Yeah, let's go. let's go, let's go, that's cash. Come on, come on. 38 states in Washington, D.C. have legalized sports betting, most with minimum age requirements set at 21. But companies like Price Picks and Fliff offer betting-like experiences for younger customers, operating under fantasy sports or sweepstake game regulations. Did you guys start at 18? Yes, yes, I started on my, I downloaded Fliff on my 18th birthday. Oh. Yeah, if it's legal, I'm gonna use it. So mm -hmm. obviously, you know, like like we said, Liam and I aren't 21, yeah. so we can't use like FanDuel or yeah, any right. of these, but there are ways to bet when you are 18. I have a couple friends 
who like use like their dad's email on Fandle online. It says a fifty year old man's place in the bet, but no, it's it's like my buddy. You do it and you enjoy it. Yeah. Um But you see some downsides? Yes, there are definitely a lot of downsides. But yeah. do you remember when I was betting on a uh, Mexican League winter baseball? Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Me and Liam were in the library ones, and I was like, dude, I can't study anymore. I have to do something else. And then I, I, I went to Fliff, and I bet on Mexican League Baseball. You'll spend it the won. presidency. I, I was this close to betting on, on who was going to win the president. I talked to my dad a little bit. I had to be like, I don't have any money. You know what I mean? Because I did genuinely lose a lot of my money I had. I was like, all right, like, that's it. Like, that's too much. That's enough. You have to sell down. We've created an epidemic of child gambling, and it's America's most neglected major problem. The more citizens put their money into these games, the more money they're going to lose. Les Bernal is the national director of Stop Predatory Gambling, a nonprofit advocacy group working to roll back commercialized sports betting. One of the whole claims that the gambling industry and the professional sports teams, you know, and state officials all said, hey, if you legalize this, you know, we're going to get rid of illegal gambling. That was the claim, the myth. But the reality is when you bring in more forms of commercialized gambling sanctioned by the state, there's no evidence from any jurisdiction that illegal gambling goes down. And the mm. reason for that, if anything, illegal gambling always ends up going up because it normalizes the activity. Now, the industry will say there's still safeguards in place. How are kids affected by this? One primary way that kids are affected by it, and probably the most significant way, is the relentless advertising and marketing that kids are exposed to who watch any kind of sporting event today in our country. Gambling ads aired on TV 60,000 times in 2023, and the industry is expected to spend $1.3 billion in advertising in 2024, including with CBS News parent company, Paramount. $200 instantly, just for betting five bucks. The promotion strategy includes endorsements from celebrities and former athletes, as well as partnerships with media companies, some teams have put gambling ads directly on the field and have even built brick and mortar sports books inside their stadiums. Betting is a part of the experience. You're not just down here to watch the game. The advertisements are clear as day that if you're gonna come down here, <laughs> Make sure you're putting some money on the game. Lee Percy Christian is a part-time Arizona State student who began gambling after the state legalized online sports betting in 2021. This is where it is for me in Phoenix, the belly of the beast. After months of battling problem gambling habits, Christian voluntarily signed up for a self-exclusion program to ban himself from accessing betting apps and casinos. It's relieving and knowing that I can't get in. Um, but, you know, the temptation is always gonna be there. Caesars, right down there. We have FanDuel here. So, we're all in in America on sports betting. When did you last place a bet? <sighs> Let's see. Today's Friday. I'm going on my second week. Yeah, I'm going on my second week. This is a day at a time. It has to be, you know? When it goes into your phone, you're literally sitting in a casino at home. You're sitting in a casino in your restroom. You're sitting in a casino at your bed. You are always there. Christian says his problems began in 2020 after he was arrested during a protest for unlawful assembly and was held in jail for nine days. 2020 was really traumatic for me. And I do feel like at a certain point, I used sports betting as a way to escape the trauma, a way to see some self-healing, when in reality, I'm choosing self-destruction. In November 2023, Christian lost his job as a community organizer. At the time, he had $10,000 in his bank account but gamble through all of it over the course of one week. Whatever I had left, it was gone very fast. Uh -huh. And my grandmother, I called her and I was like, you know, how much money do you have right now? And 
she sent it and I started gambling with it. I knew at that point that I didn't have control. It's one thing to be like, you know, I need grocery money. But it's another thing to lie and then to use those funds that were given to me in, as a support system mm. so carelessly. Have you ever dealt with addiction before? I've dealt with alcoholism. You know, so this isn't my first rodeo in recovery at all. But the damage from sports betting, in my opinion, was wor is worse. It's an isolating addiction. You don't want people to know, you know, and you can hide it more than anything because I'm not shooting it in my veins, right. right? I'm not smoking. You can't see a physical change, mm -hmm. but in the back of my mind, you know, it's eating at me. According to the American Psychiatric Association, gambling falls in the same addictive disorder categories, alcohol, tobacco, and opioids. 86% of online gambling profits come from 5% of the gamblers. The gambling industry business model, whether it's state lotteries, regional casinos, online gambling operators, it's based on the addicted gambler. The purpose of the industry is to get you to play to extinction. And that means until all your money is gone. By the end of my gambling, I had found myself making upwards of 100 to 150 bets a night, and that's just on sports. You feel like you have no other alternative but to keep going because you've dug yourself such a deep hole, but you're just digging in the same direction. Rob Minnick has been educating young people about his experience with gambling addiction since starting recovery more than a year ago. We admitted that we were powerless over gambling, that our lives had become unmanageable. Any betting or wagering for self or others, whether for money or not, no matter how slight or insignificant, where the outcome is uncertain or depends upon chance or skill, constitutes gambling. I started gambling at the age of 18 with daily fantasy sports. As time went on, that moved to regular sports betting, casino games, and by the end of it, was spinning slots in my pocket with just listening in my headphones, not even needing to see the result to know what had happened. I had progressively fallen deeper and deeper into the world of online sports betting. My mom said it was just constant shame and embarrassment how they failed as parents that I was in this situation. And uh, I was dating a girl from school and she found out the extent of my lying and my behavior and broke up with me. And really, I was able to see more clearly the culmination of all my misbehavior and how essentially my life was completely shattered. I started gambling as something for me, like something that was just for me. I didn't have to be a mom. I didn't have to be a worker. I didn't have to be a boss, um, a daughter. Um, I had to be responsible for nothing. I went from being like soccer mom um, to being a degenerate. Um, I couldn't even look at myself in the mirror and recognize who I was seeing. I lost my job and um, my insurance for my kids um, and myself. And um, I decided I was gonna like clean up my entire life um, and then kill myself. Um, and I found the 12 step program and found out that compulsive gambling was a thing. I had not realized that I buried every emotion that I had for five years um, inside. And I broke, um, I couldn't think of anything except for gambling. Um, and with the accessibility to do it on my phone, I did it driving to work, I did it in the bathroom, I did it when I woke up. I needed to have that hope in the dream world that I lived in, um, that I was gonna change and fix every problem in my life with the big win that I was gonna have. And um, the fact of the matter is, it, I never won. This all sounds strangely familiar. My dad had a gambling problem. I saw it manifested, you know, in many ways throughout my childhood. Um, you know, we had difficulties financially. Um, my mom was sort of emotionally a wreck. I thought he was just an asshole. I thought he was immature. I thought he was financially irresponsible. But when I hear your stories, this, there's no way to escape the fact that this, this, is, a, is an illness. 
you as a, a, a child in dealing with parents of, of addicts, reversal on it in, to, in today's world is the 16, 17, 18 year olds, 19, 21 year olds that, that get addicted. Years ago before online casinos, if we had a person come in and under 24 years old, it was rare, all right? Now the norm, the real norm, it's kids coming in at 17 years old. That's the norm. When you don't go to your drug dealer, he doesn't usually show up and knock on the door and say, hey, do you need something? You know, and, um, and that's what they do. Where is the concern for that person? I mean, I understand that it's a business, right? But with drugs, they held doctors accountable for prescriptions of opioids. With bars, they've held bartenders and, and you know, restaurant owners accountable for over-serving a patron. I'm accountable 100% for being an addict and falling into the path and losing my way. I'm responsible for that. But I'm not the only one that's responsible. When you run commercialized gambling as a business, there's an adversarial relationship between the gambling operator and the citizen who's gambling. That's why it's been illegal in our country for most of its history. And it's still illegal in our country to run a commercialized sports book. The only exception is when you partner with state government. Since the Supreme Court lifted the gambling ban in 2018, states that have legalized sports betting have collected more than $4 billion in tax revenue combined. We need to restrict commercialized online gambling advertising, just like we do other known dangerous addictive products. FanDuel, DraftKings, Caesars, BetMGM, these are an extension of a government program. States are, are profiting re relentlessly from this because they have an inherent conflict of interest. The safer they make this product, the more they restrict the advertising, the less money the state makes. And that's why we have an epidemic today of child gambling across this country. Good, how are you? We have a collective 10.5k on the body. Me and my boy took it. I put, I put 200 on it. Oh, oh, we're done. We might be in trouble, dude. Let's switch to Mojo. Five bucks, who gets the next bucket? I'm going Bonnie. Now they shoot. Now they shoot. Yes, no turnovers here. $10,500. I mean, it's a great feeling. When you win a bet, there's nothing better. And when you lose, it's sick. Like, you feel like you want to throw up. People chase that feeling. People are chasing that high from winning. That makes it so powerful, but also so dangerous. Every night, I'm sitting on an app, looking at all the scores for every second of the night, stressing it out. I don't even have favorite teams anymore, really. It's just <laughs> it's just whoever I'm betting on. Do you ever think about how you are part of and you are feeding uh, a piece of uh, this industry that is, as you say, kind of ruining sports? I, I like to think that I'm doing good. The small group of people that I have, they're realizing that there's a better way. There's a different way to do it. They can be disciplined. These sports books are big and fancy for a reason. I mean, they're whether they put the, the 1-800-GAMBLER number on the TV and tell you to play within your limits, um, they're not gonna cut you off if you continue to lose. Less than a month after quitting gambling, with no money left, Christian was evicted from his apartment. Well, this is a long way from Phoenix. What, uh, what happened? Yeah, you know, um... I, I could not continue. I couldn't afford to stay where I was at in Arizona. You know, I couldn't afford to stay where I was at. After I lost my job, I had enough to pay for my rent. And um, I wanted more. Yeah. So I gambled it. Eventually, I didn't have anything left. You're with your folks now? Yeah, I'm with my parents. When I got here, I had to really tell them, you know, I'm dealing with this. This is where my sports betting has gotten me. And that's why I'm home. When your rent money is at stake, mm -hmm. are you aware of just how risky each wager is? Yeah, I think that's why I place it. Like, the risk is the rush. I'm low that I'm losing things in my life. 
I know that I've lost my relationships. I know that I've lost the love of my life. I know that I've lost my job. But I don't want to think about that. So I continue to just place those wagers. I continue to tell myself that once you hit big, then all of this is going to change. Can you confidently say now that, you know, as you're struggling with the depths of despair, that one more wager isn't going to change all that? Being here in the bottom and like really like sitting in that despair, if anything, one more wager would just help me forget about the pain. And that's what's scary. What I think about the most is why? Why didn't I stop? You know, why didn't I say, why didn't I realize at certain, like at each point, why didn't I realize that I was losing so much? Mm -hmm.